Well, thank you so much for joining us this Friday evening for this chancellor's lecture. Uh, as the chancellor, I have so many uh, wonderful privileges, and I'm often asked to lend my name and support to so many worthy things in Nashville and certainly on our great campus. And this is a very special privilege for me, and I am very pleased to be able to say uh, welcome to the Chancellor's Lecture. Uh, this is uh, a very, very special one, however, because uh, it uh, really is a celebration of one of the greatest institutions at Vanderbilt, which is the Robert Penn Warren Center, and 20 years of accomplishments. <laughs> The uh, wonderful thing about uh, this lecture, and of course, so many of our chancellor's lectures, is it's great to see my faculty colleagues as I look out into the audience, but a university always is really part of a community, and that community is Nashville. And so what is really uh, uh, special is to see so many of those alumni, friends, you know, people who wish they were back in college uh, <laughs> because of the wonderful years you spend there joining us. So uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this lecture. Uh, let me say just a uh, few things about our lecture, uh, lecture tonight, our speaker, Bruce Cole. And it is a distinguished career as a scholar and as a public servant. Um, he launched uh, an initiative, We the People, a program to encourage the teaching, study, and understanding of American history and culture. Seminars are given on our nation's historic landmarks, program to distribute uh, more about American history and culture. Uh, I was uh, very pleased to see this since uh, I have a passion for American history and I'm teaching a class on the Federalist Papers in the spring, so I hope I'm contributing, Bruce, to this initiative. Um, other things he has done, uh, he has begun a, a partnership between uh, the endowment and the Library of Congress to catalog and digitize the story of our past through historic newspapers that allow for 30 million pages to be on the internet as the home of the digital archive for the news uh, 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 over the years. Uh, we welcome and celebrate uh, this incredible initiative and the preservation of this resource for the American global community and certainly for scholars. He's now launching uh, something called Picture America. And I think he spent uh, part of the day uh, uh, talking about this initiative. And it's one that helps students trace our national story through the great artistic masterpieces. And for those of us who love art museums and go look at portraits or Benton paintings and things like that, it's just wonderful to see somebody integrating America's great art and its artists into American history. Now, um, he took the bold leap uh, uh, from a very distinguished, happy life as a scholar at Indiana, Indiana University. He was a distinguished professor of art history, and he was a professor of uh, comparative literature. In 2005, he was appointed by the president and um, he, was, uh, uh, he was appointed by the president, and he was chosen for a second term as the head of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this is remarkable, and maybe he should run for president. He was unanimously approved by the Senate of the United States. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, Bruce, congratulations on that. Um, a remarkable Vita. He has written m uh, 14 books many of them about the Renaissance. I am just delighted to be able to listen to Bruce Cole tonight. Thank you very much. Well, I don't have my speech. Does anybody know what happened to it? Everyone's a nightmare. <laughs> well, I, I'm delighted to be here. Good evening. Um, I did teach at a 
university for a long, long time, just reminiscing about the start of a new semester, which I know is underway here, and thinking about you know, the eager anticipation of teaching a new class or seeing a new group of bright-eyed students or trying to find a parking place <laughs> or uh, looking forward to those faculty meetings, uh, having a meeting with the chancellor or the dean. So um, I am delighted to be here. Before I begin, let me just um, acknowledge a few people in the audience. Um, my student, Sherry Schoenefeld, who's a member of the faculty here. And uh, Bill Ivey, where are you, Bill? Oh, there he is right there. Um, as you all know, Bill was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, he did a wonderful job there. Um, I think he set that endowment on a path that um, made it uh, not only in the arts community, but uh, in, in Congress. Uh, a very viable, important institution. So, you know, that's not an easy job. My hat's off to you, Bill. Um, uh, Rob, Robert Cheatham and Kate Stevenson from the um, Humanities Tennessee. Uh, Ed Frieden, my uh, colleague from Indiana University, who was stolen away by uh, Vanderbilt, I guess, about eight years ago. Uh, and uh, Mona Frederick, who works with him at the Robert, she's the executive director, I guess, of Robert Penn Warren Center, and Carol Swain, who is a member of our National Council. So I am uh, just delighted to be here, um, and I'm very pleased to join the Robert Penn Warren Center in um, celebrating its 20th anniversary. And I'm very proud of the role that the National Endowment played in helping to launch the center two decades ago. Uh, in 1989, the NEH awarded the center a $480,000 challenge grant to help establish uh, an endowment for the program. Our challenge grant program is something I'm very proud of. Uh, over its existence, it's leveraged about $2 billion out of the private and corporate and foundation sector. And I'd like to use that $2 billion because, as Bill knows, the endowments have only million-dollar budgets. And million-dollar budgets in Washington are decimal bills. So uh, two, two billion, I'll say it again. Uh, and I'm, as a, as a NEH chair, I'm really thrilled to come here and see what a terrific return there has been on the NEH's uh, investment. This is a thriving center for humanities and research at one of the nation's finest universities. So thank you very much for inviting me. And I very much appreciate your emphasis, something we're interested in, the endowment on interdisciplinary learning and research among Vanderbilt faculty and students. So on this happy anniversary, we celebrate the Robert Penn Warren uh, Center's past, uh, but we also must look forward. And in the years to come, the uh, humanities are going to face some exciting challenges and some serious challenges as well. So I am no seer or prophet, but as the chairman of the NEH, I do see trends in our grant application. And my job gives me a good overview on what's happening in the humanities. Uh, I happen to sit in, whenever I'm in town, on all the grant review panels. Uh, you know, the endowment brings people from all over the country and all sorts of people to sit around for a day and have a first crack at the applications. So I've probably been to over 1,000 panels. And I go there because I like to see uh, what kind of applications are coming in, getting on the ground there. But that gives me a really interesting overview of what's happening in the various uh, constituencies that the NEH supports. So tonight, uh, let me just take my uh, view on the state of the humanities, focusing on three major areas. So one development that is having a tremendous impact in the humanities is the rise of the digital age. So when I arrived in the endowment in 2001, I had no idea that words like petabyte and interoperability would become part of my everyday vocabulary. In fact, I didn't even know what they were. Uh, you know, I came to the digital age light, very lately. Um, I uh, had an electric typewriter, and then I moved back to manual. 
Uh, and then one summer I was in Europe and I came back, I don't know, maybe Sherry remembers this, and there was a brand new computer on my desk and my wife had bought it and she said, learn it. Uh, but after I had been at the endowment for a year or so, this sort of the scales fell from my eyes. Uh, and it became cle clear to me that the digital uh, technology revolutionized the humanities in three uh, key ways. Uh, first, digitization will increase collaboration in the humanities. Now, until recently, and I hate to say this, the hard sciences and the social sciences have been far ahead of the humanities in this regard. Uh, those disciplines embrace collaborative work. It's their nature. Uh, the humanities disciplines tend to prize individual, individual scholarship. Our idea is still, you know, that lone scholar pouring through the archives or hunching over a desk writing feverishly. Now, of course, this uh, model has certainly produced great scholarship, and many humanities scholars will continue to work this way, and the NEH will continue to support them. Yet, a significant part of the humanities' future lies in the collaborative, collaborative scholarship that the digital age makes possible. Uh, a valuable example of this is the wiki tool. Uh, I had first written Wikipedia, but I thought maybe that's just too controversial. So let me talk about the wiki, of which the Wikipedia is, uh, which these wikis demonstrate the remarkable results possible when we tap into the shared knowledge of enthusiastic communities. And I will talk about Wikipedia for a minute. We have a, a magazine, and I always do an interview, and I had the pleasure of interviewing Jimbo Wales, who was the founder of Wikipedia. It was a fascinating interview. He's not all that sold on Wikipedia, by the way. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it is a phenomenon. And one of the things I asked him, I said, how many people work at Wikipedia? And he said, two. Uh, and everybody else is a volunteer. And it's their enthusiastic volunteers. They do that because they want to do it for better or worse. Uh, but the wiki, uh, is, this shows us the future of reference work. That is the absolute future of reference work. Uh, they can be continually updated, created, and edited in collaboration, vast collaboration, with users from around the globe. And they're uh, pretty adept at policing themselves and remaining, uh, having accuracy and balance and um, and quality, um, you know, it is, um, I won't get into it, but this is the way a lot of software is designed now uh, and, and the like. And, you know, I just think of, well, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Um, and the second key change is that data-driven scholarship will allow humanists to create new questions uh, and discover new knowledge. So the core data set for humanity scholars consists of objects, you know, like books and uh, journals, paintings, newspapers, audio recordings, sculpture. And these are the things that we humanists study. Uh, but in the past, these objects were read and searched on a very small scale. Uh, no one scholar could deal with more than a subset of the works in his or her field. But in the digital age, the scale of available materials has exploded. I mean, it's just exploded exponentially. In the past few years, massive amounts of cultural heritage materials have been digitized. Scholars have now access to millions, millions of digitized books and journals and recordings. And in the sciences, this data-driven approach to knowledge made possible com computing, which has produced incredible results. And I always like to think of the scientific parallel to humanities computing uh, in, uh, as the Genome Project. Um, uh, the Genome Project, um, you know, could not have been possible without a massive com computation. I mean, it's an international uh, effort, uh, and it's available uh, online. And I think this is the scientific parallel to humanities computation. Now, humanities scholars are exploring how this digitization can benefit their disciplines. 
The third key change is that digitizing allows us to greatly increase public access to the to humanities resources. And as chairman of a federal agency, this of course is key because all our whatever we do should be available free to every citizen of the United States. Digital archives and search tools are making primary documents, scholarship, and other humanities resources much more affordable and much broadly available and, and much quicker of access. But you know, these changes, while uh, exciting, they ra they're raising some serious questions. Uh, how will the digital age transform the way we write and we think and we read and we learn? Exactly what kinds of new knowledge might humanity scholars acquire? What new questions might all this data compel them to ask? What content tools do we need to de develop to help scholars turn this tidal wave of information into wisdom? And how can humanities take advantage of digital technology without changing what is fundamentally meaningful and unique about the humanities? Well, these are all big questions. And at the NEH, we're taking a leadership role in exploring these questions and promoting the application of digital technology to humanities scholarship, teaching, and access. And in 2006, we launched our Digital Humanities Initiative. And this uh, past April, we turned it into a permanent office of Digital Humanities, or ODH. You can't be in Washington without using lots of initials. So, um, And this is run, I have to give credit where credit is due, by Brett Bobley, who was uh, our chief IT officer. And after I saw what was happening, I asked Brett to come in my office. And I said, Brett, uh, what are we going to do about this? And he said, you know, I'll come back to you in a couple of weeks. And he is now our digital czar, and he has done a fantastic job of getting the digital humanities and technology into every one of our divisions. Uh, so this office works with other NEH staff and its scholars and with other funding bodies, both in the United States and abroad, to pursue the great opportunities offered by digital humanities. And one of the things about the digital, uh, about the digital age and digitization is that it's a kind of bridge that can span continents and oceans. So at the NEH, we've begun to form a series of partnerships, international partnerships. We have a partnership with JISC, which is the digitizing arm of the higher education uh, establishment in Great Britain. We have uh, a partnership with the DFG in Germany, with the National Research Council in Italy. And I'm going to sign one with China, and there are a number of other countries that are interested in partnering with us. And what we can do is we can work on interests, common interests, on in both countries or in combinations of countries. And we support part of this research, they support the other half. So for every dollar we spend, we get another one. And sometimes when these funding agencies are richer than we are, we get more than one. So let me give you a few examples of the type of projects we're pursuing through the Office of Digital Humanities. Uh, one of our goals is to start a conversation about how supercomputers can be used for humanities research. And this press, past spring, we announced our new humanities high performance computing initiative, HHPC for short. And the Office of Digital Humanities is working with our colleagues at the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation uh, outfits which are uh, much richer than we are, by the way, to show humanities scholars high speed performance computing and data storage, which is a very important aspect of this, can be used in their work. We recently announced a new grant competition with the Department of Energy to award time and training on the supercomputers. We're going to award a million hours of supercomputer time. And one day I was sitting in my office and I got a call from Ray Orbach, who heads the Department of Science at the Department of Energy. He said, We'd like to talk to you. Come on over. We want to talk to you about you using our supercomputers. And you know, if you could have told me seven years ago, I would have gotten a call from the head of uh, the Office of Science at uh, Department of Energy to talk about supercomputers. I would have thought you're absolutely crazy. Uh, but th they scientists love the things that we do because they have a kind of a nuance and a vari variability which some of their supercomputers don't some of their work doesn't embody, and the Department of Energy is really interested to get people working on the supercomputers, not only in the sciences. So another 
Office of Digital Humanities programs is our Digital Humanities Startup Grants. And these uh, grants encourage uh, people to come to us with bright ideas, and we provide them seed money to help these promising projects get off the ground. Now, this is patterned on IBM and Google Startup Grants. And one of the wonderful things about this competition is that always in this competition, about 70% of the applicants are first-time applicants to the endowment. And that doesn't mean that they come from some place that no one's ever heard of. A lot of these are Internet Peace schools. But we have a whole new catchment of applicants. And we also say that some of these projects are going to fail. Now, the NEH has never said that before, but of course, all our projects over the last 43, of 43 years have always succeeded. So we also have digital workshops which help K through 12 educators learn how to use digital resources to strengthen their teaching. And the, you know, everything is out there, but you have to know how to use it. You have to have discernment. You have to have certain kinds of skills. Uh, and our digital humanities challenge grants are helping endow digital humanities centers another large-scale project. A lot of this great work is coming from universities that have established digital humanity centers where people from all disciplines meet uh, and work on these very interesting projects. Now, I don't know I, whether Vanderbilt has one of these, but hey, that might be a good idea. So um, now let me assure you, while the NEH is embracing a digital future for the humanities, this does not mean that we will end our support for traditional print projects and, uh, and other traditional forms of scholarship. Far from it. Far from it. I mean, books are technology that will never go away. I love books. I actually was reading one the other day. Um, so let me assure you. But it does mean that we will recognize and welcome fa the far-reaching potential of this new frontier of the humanities. And as a federal agency, the endowment's mission is to bring the humanities to every American, and we seek to, ha to harness the power of digital technology to preserve humanities resources and scholarship and make them, make the humanities accessible to everyone. Everyone who has an internet connection should be able to get all of our products. Now, this brings me to another important challenge that we face, the need to democratize the humanities, and this dovetails nicely with access. NEH's founding legislation uh, states that democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. I think that's at baseline. That's what the endowment is all about. And the endowment fosters this wi wisdom by bringing the insights of the humanities to as many citizens as possible. So we're pursuing this goal in several ways. Through the We the People program, now almost six years old, and uh, this is something that we got uh, underway. Um, as soon as I came in, I'm just now about to um, celebrate the seventh year of my tenure there. I'm now the longest serving chairman. Seven years in Washington, pretty long in the tooth, let me tell you. Uh, but we started this uh, almost six years ago. The NEA and this We the People program supports projects that promote the teaching and understanding of American history and culture. So there's a whole range of these in every division, in documentary films, museum exhibitions, preservation projects, library exhibitions, workshops for teachers at American historic sites such as Ellis Island, Mount Vernon, and Pearl Harbor. And I'm very pleased to say that since 2002, the endowment's budget has gone up. I think that's a wonderful, you know, the endowment, by the way, has no endowment, all right? Uh, all our money is appropriated, and our budget has gone up something like 17 or 18 percent since 2002, and given the stringent budget years since 2002, we're very proud of that. We're very proud that that is a real significant sign of the Congress's faith in the endowment. And the We the People project alone has, 60, has had 66 million uh, new dollars. We've had over 1,500 projects in every state of the union. So one of the We the People projects that takes advantage of digital technology 
and Access is a national digital newspaper program. Uh, we partner with the Library of Congress to make uh, available fully online searchable digital files of historic newspapers from every state and territory. Now this is the first great draft of our history. This was in the news before it was history. And this is built on the endowment support over the last 25 years of the National Newspaper Program. And what we did, and I know there are people in this audience who have worked on this, uh, this was a preservation project. The endowment wanted to rescue newspapers because like the millions of bit, uh, brittle books that we microfilmed, the newspapers were burning up. As you know, in the second half of the 19th century, they were uh, made with paper that's highly acidic. And I'm sure you've had this experience of looking at old newspaper and having them crumble in your hand. So the endowment supported the discovery first, and then the cataloging, all the metadata, and then the microfilming of 100, about 140,000 different newspaper titles from all over the United States in every language. And this resulted in 70 million pages of microfilm. Well, that's great. But what are you supposed to do with 70 million pages of microfilm? It's too bad digitization wasn't in place 25 years ago, because we immediately digitized them. Uh, so that's an obstacle. But digitize them and putting the digital files on the Library of Congress website with searchable tool with tools that allow you to search it turns this enormous obstacle of 70 million pages into one of the great resources for American history. So the site contains over 600,000 pages of public campaign newspapers, students and teachers and scholars, and history buffs. Anybody now at a click of a mouse can get immediate and searchable, searchable access to this incredible resource. And ultimately, uh, Chronicling America, go to the Library of Congress website, look up Chron Chronicling America, will make more than 30 million pages of historic American newspapers available to the public for free, and we hope forever. And in February, the NEH launched the newest element of, the we, of we the People, an initiative called Picturing America. And this initiative brings very large, three by five, very high quality reproductions of American art from the beginning of the Republic to the present day to classrooms and public libraries nationwide where they can help citizens of all age connect to the people, places, and ideas that have shaped our country. Picturing America uses art in a unique way to engage students in the humanities, including history, uh, literature, social sciences, language art, civics, and so forth. You know, if, if you read a book, and again, I like books a lot, uh, the, and you're a student, the work's already done for you. Looking at a picture and that uh, discovery of um, exploration. Uh, I was at, two weeks ago, I was at a school in Anchorage talking about this, and there's wonderfully bright kids. I love to go to school and see these terrific kids and teachers bringing their imagination and their creativity. And a fifth grader raised her hand, and she said, you know, I really like this because you look at a picture and then you look inside of it. Yes. Um, so during a short three-month application window this past spring, nearly one-fifth of all schools and public libraries in the United States applied for Picturing America Awards. Uh, later this month, over 26,000 schools and public libraries will receive Picturing America sets including 504 recipients in Tennessee and 32 here in Nashville. Now, um, uh, picturing American Nights might not seem immediately re relevant to a university community. I can understand that. But I hope you see, and I think this is the point here, how effectively this initiative will promote public engagement with the humanities and raise awareness of the NEH and its activities among our citizens and our legislators. So when I some do my Hill visits, I used to be able to go up and say, oh, you know, we've got a wonderful project in one library in your district, representative. But now I can go and say, we've got 50 in your district. Um, or we've got 100 um, or more. So this is very important. Uh, and the number of that 26,000 awards we made in a three-month period is equal to all the awards in total that the NEH has made over the last 20 years. 
So I, I hope you think that's a good thing. And we have another three and final three-month um, award period going on right now. It ends October 31st. Uh, and if you know a librarian or you're one or a teacher uh, or you have a kid in school or you have a distant cousin who might be interested in this, um, pictureinamerica.neh.gov. Go and look at this wonderful website that accompanies Picture in America. So through Picture in America and many other programs, the NEH ensures that the Humanities Endowment continues to make a vital contribution to civic life. But the endowment can't do it alone. And those of you who teach and research in the humanities must also make the argument for your discipline. So this brings me to the final challenge I want to discuss tonight, the need to restore the humanities to a central place in higher education and public discourse. Now, at the best, the humanities help us carry on the rich tradition of our civilization, and they help us to seek answers to the enduring questions. What is justice? What is human nature? Is there good and evil, right and wrong? These great enduring questions that are at the base of the humanities. Most serious students begin college excited about the possibility of exploring such questions. They're eager to do that. Yet too often these days, humanities teachers and departments avoid them, either because there's simply no room for them in the curriculum or because humanities teachers have greater interest in specialized topics or problems, or because they don't believe it's even possible to answer these questions. Uh, indeed, the humanities today suffer a crisis of confidence, an uncertainty about what role they should play on the campus, different than, say, 100 years. Humanity scholars and teachers know their disciplines are important, but they often have trouble making that case to their colleagues or to the larger public. Now, there are several reasons for this. One is the, and I know this is not here, true here at, at Vanderbilt, uh, a rising tide of vocationalism that threatens to drown out any study that doesn't promise maximum return on the dollar. And this is uh, obviously encouraged by parents, and at some place, unfortunately, it's encouraged by administrators. Second, too many human humanists have succumbed to the temptations of self-marginalization in their field, channeling their work into narrow specialties defined by technical jargon-filled writing. Now, when taken to an extreme, this temptation denies public access to scholarly discourse. Third, we now have a famous contrarian humanities professor claiming that unlike the natural and social sciences, the humanities have no real positive effect on the world beyond the pleasure they give to those who enjoy them. I think you probably know who this is. Uh, to this way of thinking, the humanities have no broader public role to play. Instead, the most they can offer us is an insular, self-satisfied feeling, you know, similar to what a person might get playing sports or doing a very complicated crossword puzzle. But as scholars and teachers, we have an obligation not merely to claim, not merely to claim, but to demonstrate that the humanities are not merely a playground for nihilism or barnacles clinging for survival to the supposedly more practical areas of study at our universities. Nor are the humanities the luxuries or the amusements uh, for idle moments. They are the ever-renewing gifts that enlighten and enrich the lives of our citizens. So at the endowment, we're working to address vital concerns about the state of the humanities on our campuses. For example, the NEH continues its effort to improve undergraduate education, but this is a new, a new way. Um, you know, there's an old saying that I'm very fond of. Teaching is to research like sin is to confession. Without one, you don't have the other. I love that line, and I happen to believe it's true. So I'm very excited about a new grant category the NIH is now offering called Teaching Development Fellowship. That's really a pretty awful name, but um, you know we're a bureaucracy. Um, these fellowship will, fellowships will support college and university teachers pursuing research aimed specifically at deepening their core knowledge in the humanities in order to improve their undergraduate teaching. We're also working on another new grant program and one that I think will excite all those who believe that students uh, 
in humanities courses uh, should tackle the enduring questions that I mentioned just a moment ago. The NIH will soon announce guidelines for this grant program, so st stay tuned. I wanted to announce it, but they wouldn't let me. So. As scholars and teachers, you also have a vital part to play in restoring the humanities to their rightful places on campus and in our intellectual life. So let me once again encourage the scholars in this audience to use simple, clear language and to think about how you can address the broader public, not just your particular colleagues in a subfield. Rather, I'm encouraging humanity scholars to make a sincere effort to make complex ideas understandable to the intelligent and curious lay reader. By making academic thought more accessible to the public, we ensure that the wisdom of the humanities spreads wider and sinks deeper into the fabric of American thought. Not every scholar should address a, w a wider public, but more of us can do so, and we should welcome that opportunity. Humanities teachers and scholars shouldn't be content with just talking to each other. Let's show our students and our fellow citizens that the humanities have something vital to add to our national life, to our quest for truth, and to the great conversation of our civilization. Thank you very much. Uh, now comes the hard part. I've agreed to answer a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, we don't have anything in mind. What? What we? That's because the endowment does not have very specific guidelines. What you, we have guidelines that are very general. We want scholars in all fields, and we'd like to see a combination of computer scientists and technologists working with humanities to come to us with very creative ideas about using these supercomputer hours, uh, and then we'll fund the best of the best of those. No, it's the guideline. I don't think the guideline is accepting applications yet. Anything technical about this computing, uh, I'll have to refer you to Brett Bobley. <laughs> yes. Right, well, this is a question of interoperability. And we always want to be one step ahead. And what I always like to say is we better get this right, because if we don't, if we don't have real interoperability in migration, then you're not going to be able to access your bank account or book a, a, a flight or get your doctor's records and the like. So this is a big problem. It's really something that the NEH is interested in. And we are working on this. But this is a, obviously an issue that, can, that concerns not only our, in, the, our nation, but our, in the world now. But that is an issue. This interoperability is a real issue. So far, so good. Um, someone here, yes. Oh, no, I can't tell you, other than it appeared in the New York Times. <laughs> okay, what was the, who was the wicked professor that talked about the um, real lack of uh, applicability of the humanities other than just some uh, pleasurable aspect, individual pleasurable aspect? And I said, I couldn't say, but check the New York Times. That works, yeah. Right. Well, I, I'll tell you what we're, we're doing at the endowment. I mean, we, we haven't really thought along those lines. But I feel that 
our efforts in We the People are all about um, the debt that we owe to the past, the kind of sacred debt that we owe to the past, that those who have come before us, uh, who have sacrificed for our freedoms and our liberties. And it's our obligation to repay that by making sure that rising generations know those principles and ideas and our civilization as it, as it goes forward. So I think that's just part of the whole idea of knowing history and the importance of passing history on to those who will come after us. It's a, an essential part of a democracy. And uh, this has been part of American democracy since the founders. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think they could vote more intelligently, intelligently in an election if they know what went on in the past, if they know what our rights and responsibilities are and the like. Um, yes, I think I'm, one more. Uh oh, this is a hard one, Bill. Well, yeah, this is something that we're very interested in. What, we can use the bully pulpit of the NEH. We can target uh, things like this teacher development grant or uh, guidelines that deal with enduring questions. But we, uh, we can use the bully pulpit. We can use our funds, which in the grand scheme of things aren't that much. But I think it's really up to individuals on the campus. I mean, here at Vanderbilt, you have a wonderful liberal arts uh, education. A core, but that's not the place all over. And I, we are really worried about this rising tide of voc voc uh, vocationalism. But that's really, I think, the responsibility of people who who teach the humanities, who love the humanities, of the consuls, uh, and of a, and of administrators, because I believe that you come to college as an undergraduate to get an education, not instruction, and when I go around and talk to CEOs, and uh, they always tell me, you know, we want people who've gone to college who uh, have learned to think and have got some historical perspective and can write a good English uh, sentence and have some awareness and self-reflection. Get us those people, and that's really what the liberal arts do. So I, I'm, we can do some of it, but you've got to do a lot. I have one more question. Yes. No, absolutely correct. 
Um, the, the web is a great tool, but um, the critical acumen and, and judgment needs to be applied to it to use it well. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>